Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Voices of Faith and Leadership in Cody, Wyoming. Tonight's presenter is the Reverend Warren Murphy. <laughs> I did, didn't I? Very nicely. Author of the book On Sacred Ground. And he's going to be teaching us tonight about Wyoming's religious history. And he has... I don't want to sound rude, but you have lived some like this. <laughs> <laughs> and we welcome our people on Zoom and those who are going to be watching the recording. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> well, the uh, topic we're doing here is obviously a pretty big topic. It's, and it's based on the book. You all got this book. From the book right? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many do you oh, read? Oh my God, have I read the whole thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't read the whole thing yet. It's gone. <laughs> <clears throat> Just say that it took me about seven or eight years to do this, including part of a sabbatical. But the reason I started it was because when I started asking about the history of religion, denominations, uh, interfaith, whatever, um, people said, well, we don't, there really isn't anything. I mean, you have to go and uh, look at the old church histories that have been performed for congregations or something like that. And I've discovered really quickly that most of those are very biased and, and <laughs> don't get into any real issues at all. You know, they avoid important things. A good example of being the main church that was involved in the issue of the Johnson County War over in Buffalo. And uh, I figured I'd go to that church and find out what they had to say about the fact that their pastor was accused of joining the the rebellious crowd against the ranchers, who did that a little better later. And um, <clears throat> and I figured there'd be something about that in there. Nothing. <laughs> so all they said was these unfortunate times <laughs> without describing what that was. So um, <clears throat> it was really difficult. And I decided that if nobody has done it, I'll do it. Why not? I love history, I love the state, I love uh, all the, get along with all the denominations. I've been the ecumenical person for the Episcopal Church in this diocese for uh, 20, 25 years, I think. And uh, so why not do it? <clears throat> and it took a lot of time to go doing the research. I even went to Claremont School of Theology mm -hmm. to spend a summer just to learn about, with a mentor, to learn about what was happening national uh, in the country during the time of Wyoming's existence. And, uh, and that was very helpful as well. <clears throat> so um, what we're going to do is just touch on a few things. And then I urge you to raise questions about anything that has struck you in the past about our history, things that maybe didn't make sense or whatever. And um, so we'll have some time for questions, and then I'll go back and forth. And depending on what you want to know more about, I've got it all here. So um, I point out these two pictures, which are both mine. Uh, one is the Chapel of Transfiguration, which is that little church in the uh, Grand Teton National Park. Um, and there's some sewing. Yeah, you can show that. Yep. And then the other one is uh, some native art work, um, rock art as we like to call it. And this particular artwork came from Ring Lake Ranch in Du Bois. And uh, they have one of the best saved collections of rock art that there is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's well sought after people go there to look at it. Let me start by saying, um, first of all, that um, <clears throat> I always like to do this by starting with the indigenous history of religion, because they were here before any of us white people or anybody else. Um, they were here <clears throat> and very active in, in, in worship. Um, the two the two tribes, of course, that lived here in most of the Shoshone, which are today on this just the Wind River Reservation, which, by the way, was originally called the Shoshone Reservation, and it got changed later when the Arapaho moved in. And the others are the Crow, or the, uh, uh, they've got a new name, I can never pronounce it very well, <clears throat> that they like to be called. And you'll hear more about that from Mary Keller on um, 
when she talks on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And I, that's where I have the try comes out here to her event every year we do this. So um, we get to know the crow pretty well. But they all had their own, every tribe has its own version of something that's similar to other tribes. And I only say that by saying that the Lakota, for instance, I, I love their definition of God. It's not God. It's God is simply referred to, for the most part, as big mystery. It's just a big mystery. We don't challenge it. We don't ask the questions about it. We just know it's a powerful force in a sacred place. Um, <clears throat> the other name that they do use for that is uh, oftentimes you'll hear is Juan Cantanco. Juan Cantanco is the big mystery. Uh, and again, there's a lot of little signs of all the different uh, tribes that have been through here. Some of them passed through, some of them hunted here, some of them made war in Wyoming. Um, and um, there are a lot of those little signs that are left. For instance, there are a lot of rock art displays. I could say Ring Lake Ranch has some of the best. And it's not just on the ranch, it's the surrounding area. And that's called the Fremont style, or Dinwiddie, um, named after Dinwiddie Canyon, which is located outside Du Bois and um, out of the middle of nowhere. It's there, and that's a secret very sacred canyon to the Shoshone special. They still do burials up in the canyon, in caves. Uh, I got to hike it once, right, with permission, of course, and it's a fascinating hike, one of the best hikes I've ever taken. Um, it's a little rugged in spots. It's got a ledge you have to go along sideways so you won't fall off the cliff. Um, it's got a natural bridge. It's got a lake out there. And of course, it has the burial caves. And um, my permit for doing that, for being out there, is that um, uh, don't go to the caves. And I had no intention of doing that anyway. So there's, again, each, each tribe has its different understanding of what is sacred. Legend Rock is located right down here near Thermopolis. That's one of the biggest, uh, also biggest areas of rock art. And it's a... So I think it's a state park officially, but it's administered through the, the state um, Hot Springs State Park because they're the, the real state park. It's nearest. That's great. You can go in there any time of the year. They have it open. The sign says May through September, but you can drive back there anytime and just go walk, get over a fence, and then look at it. Um, also, we have right up in the mountains here. The medicine wheel. How many of you have been in the medicine wheel? Just, just you know, one, or two, two. And that's another place that's um, considered sacred to a number of tribes, and nobody knows a lot about it, and they'll admit that. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a great story about that. <clears throat> uh, a number of years ago, we had a presentation at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center on the medicine wheel, and they brought in an anthropologist and an elder in the name of um, Edmund Brown, I think his name was. And they were going to talk about the medicine wheel. And they had pictures and whatever. And uh, the thing that happened that was fascinating was um, there was a big crowd that came in and they filled the place. <clears throat> and I got in to, to listen to it. And um, they talked about it and what it is, everything, some pictures. And then the anthropologist took over and he spent had to be almost an hour describing all of the different types of people who may have been here and may have lived in Wyoming. And it was a little boring, but at least it was about uh, the people who were up there and doing that. And then the elder got up, and he was a rapid leader, and, uh, and he got up and he just stood there, quiet, didn't say anything. <laughs> we're all waiting for him to say something. And uh, he finally said, uh, well, he said, uh, the medicine wheel, yes, the medicine wheel is all I can say about it. It's it's a sacred place. It's a sacred place. He said no. <laughs> so then the good questions from the audience. There was this one woman who was present who was really sort of agitated about the whole thing, um, and she uh, she was really feisty and she wanted to pick a fight with somebody. And she said, you know. There's a story out there, a rumor, and I think it's probably true that those rocks up at the medicine wheel are not the original rocks. 
people have come and changed him and moved him around, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and so she said that to Brown. And he just thought about it, and like a good album, just thought about it, thought about it. And then he got up and said, well, you know, it might be true. <laughs> the rocks have been moved around, and, and different rocks have replaced them. But it's a sacred place, <laughs> sacred space. And that was it. And I think that said the whole story right there. <laughs> it made it very clear. Uh, but it is a great place to go. And there are offerings left. They have a lot of protection for it now because people were stealing rocks. Mm -hmm. And the Forest Service oversees it. And if you want to see what ancient life is about, that's a place to go. Uh, you can only get up there in the warm parts of the year. And it's the wintertime. Yeah. It's all based on the sun and the way it comes in and, and the lines of the rocks and how they're further in. Um, but it's worth doing. <clears throat> and then another thing, of course, we have a lot of is uh, sheep eater remains. We have quite a few in the Cody area. It's actually a sheep eater town uh, up, in, up in the mountains. It's just made out of logs, and they put logs together, and the sheep eaters lived in there. Then there's sheep traps. And the sheep traps are very sophisticated. And um, then we have a no two of them that we found up in Sunlight Basin. And uh, I take people there occasionally. So it's um, a lot of things to look at and take. And there are also uh, little uh, vision quest sites, one right here on the reservoir. And, uh, and they're scattered around as well. Again, Sunlight has quite a few. And that's where people go on their own to fast. And, uh, and just spend time, maybe a week out there doing nothing but, but just bathing and looking east because all the, the places are east facing. So all this is here. I mean, we've, I think they've traced it back at least 11,000 years of habitation and different religious things that have gone on. <coughs> um, so that's, that's just a good thing to know. Um, and one of the things that most all indigenous or Indian people, I still call them Indians, they don't mind it. <laughs> it's the way people like to call them indigenous. Um, but one of the things that they all have in common that, that they do do is um, it's the idea of space over time, space over time. And uh, George Tinker, who used to teach at I left until he retired, um, put it very well. He said, you know, white people in the churches, they'll fight over the time of the service. They'll fight over it. They'll be splits in congregations if you try to change the time. It's true. But for native peoples, you know, we don't care about what time it starts. <laughs> we have Indian time. <laughs> it starts when everybody's there. You're ready to go. But we, what we do care about is space. You don't change the location, you keep the space. And I always thought that was pretty good. Um, so to tell the story, they were here first. They had their own religious rights. They had a lot of their own history. A lot of it is oral. Their traditions were carried out until the white people came and made them give up some. Um, and what we, what we then saw was the arrival of the white people were coming and they were outsiders. First were the trappers, and they came here the earliest. Uh, they were French, they were British, they were um, even American eventually. <clears throat> and then came the miners, because the size of gold, silver, whatever. And so that's where you had a lot of old mining towns on the state. And the third is, was the military. And they came to pave the way for more white people to come and to keep Indian people in line. And, um, and that's where the quote, Indian Wars all began. And there's a lot to those wars, but I, you know, I hate to call them wars because it was basically Native people defending their land. And they were willing to do that. Um, the first outsiders also were led by a, an original, and these are the Christian outsiders, the first Protestants. Um, these were people who come, well, the first actual Catholic was Pierre, Jean Pierre de Smet. He was a Jesuit, came out here early by sent to the Jesuits to reform Indians and make them into Christians. And the Smet didn't really buy that. He tried to stay away from that as much as he could. And um, 
but they did start a number of missions, mostly in Montana, and they did, but they did come through a little bit of Wyoming. And, um, but in Montana, there's a lot of Catholic missions that were designed for Native people. Um, <clears throat> the three major trails that people came on were Oregon Trail, of course, that's the biggest, and everybody came on that when they came. And also the Mormon Trail, Mormons in the 1840s came out and they were headed for their Zion, which is their promised land. And uh, they knew a herd was somewhere out there and they found it in Utah. But they did come uh, and use their own trail because they were not liked by the other, uh, the more Protestant people who were coming out. And the Mormon Trail most basically covers the Black River. And uh, Oregon Trail runs mostly on one side, the Mormons use the other side. <laughs> so they stay away from each other. Uh, Casper is a good example of where that all happens. Um, the first Protestant service and people were um, by, again, missionaries uh, who came out with the trappers for a rendezvous. And there they could meet many of the tribes who came to the rendezvous. There were only a couple in Wyoming. Most of them were in um, Montana, Idaho, etc. This general area, however. But one of the biggest ones that took place was in the town of Daniel, what is now Daniel. Uh, and Daniel was the location. Uh, everybody would come, all the tribes, all the hunters, all the trappers. Where's Daniel? So what? Where's Daniel? It's over near Pinedale. And it's it, the, there's, a mark, there's markers there now, including the first Catholic church service held, was held there and up on a hill. And uh, um, it's a great place to go visit. But it was down in a swamp. And so I think when they put the Catholic monument up there, they went up on the hill to get away from the mosquitoes. That's my first <laughs> film that is fact. But the first Protestant group that came out was led by Marcus Whitman. And many of you have heard of him. Dr. Marcus Whitman, he was a physician. And uh, he's the one who took the famous bullet out of Jim Bridger's back. And he impressed everybody doing that with his surgery, right in the middle of the rendezvous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Samuel Parker, who was a very stern congregationalist, and um, <clears throat> a little re reference to that here. Um, Yeah. Page 324, is that what you're no, saying? No, just 23. Um, 23. Well, anyway, what, this was about a Christian advocate, and that was a magazine that, that the Protestants printed to, um, to say that Indian people needed conversion. They're all out here being heathens, and that sent many of the missionaries out here. Um, near the run who was held was a confluence of the New Fork and Green River um, near the present day Pinedale. Green River Valley became a favorite of the mountain men because it offered abundant game and grazing for their livestock. The majestic Wind River Mountains to the east bordered the valley, and what is now called the Wyoming Range was to the west. It was lush and green in the summer. So that was one of the good reasons for coming out to this place. The Reverend Samuel Parker was a congregationalist minister who came out of the New England Calvinist stock. <laughs> Studying any religion, that can be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. True to this heritage, he viewed the world as a place of moral depravity in need of God's saving grace. And his encounter with the mountain men and the Indians that summer, this was 1852, oh, this 1832. Um, <clears throat> only invigorated his desire to preach salvation. Dr. Marcus Whitman, on the other hand, was a Presbyterian who came across as being a bit worldlier. He quickly won the respect of the rendezvous goers by extracting an Arabate from the back of legendary mountain man, Jim Bridger. Bridger had suffered this wound after the 1832 rendezvous at Pierre's Hole in present day Idaho during a battle with the Blackfeet. Whitman performed his surgery in the great outdoors, with a host of Bridger's compatriots all looking on. His medical skills were a bit more appreciated 
at the gathering of our Parker's calls for righteousness. <laughs> uh, that, that's just the way it worked out. The first Protestant service was held in what is now Bondurant. And there's a marker out there. If you go out toward Jackson from that direction, you'll see the marker marking the site. First Catholic service didn't happen until quite a few years later. And that happened up on the hill above that rendezvous location. Um, in the 40s and 60s, the settlers, miners, and Mormons were all looking for their own personal Zion. Uh, and it was a conflict with the LDS and the others. And I have to point that out because that clues as time goes on. Um, Father DeSmet was there as well, and he was well liked by, by Indian people. And he became the negotiator with a lot of the treaties that were formed, especially the one in 1868, which covered the Shoshone in the West and all the other tribes that covered and elsewhere at Fort um, Laramie in the East. Um, I'm going to ask you this question. How many of you have been to Fort Laramie? Well, you've been busy. <laughs> Fort Laramie, it's a classic place. Don't go in the summer. Well, it can be hot. <laughs> They're open all year, except in the summer when you have one. Yeah, but There's the other stuff. think about the time in the summer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I point out that the first time, I'm doing this just in general right now, I'll get back to some of the details. But um, the key year for the state of Wyoming, even though all these people were coming in and Native people already being here, was 1868. That's a year everybody should know. Two big things happened that year. Um, a lot of things happened that year, but two big things. One, Wyoming became a territory. Well, they were no longer just people who were out here, but we became an actual territory. Um, and also there were treaties formed both at Fort Laramie and Fort Bridger. Fort Bridger one had um, moved traveling tribes and Shoshone away from the trails, the Oregon Trail and the others, because that was the military's purpose, is to get Indian people off the trails. Uh, because they didn't tend to get into conflict with them once in a while. You've seen the TV shows. <laughs> Quite inaccurate, but nonetheless. Um, and also, uh, the one in Fort Bridger was for the Lakota and all these, the Plains Indians. And they were given, in that first treaty, um, a right to the what's now called the Powder River Basin, and all that country east of the uh, big ones over here were given to those tribes to hunt and to just wander around and do what they needed in return for moving off the um, the, the trails. Uh, that, of course, was violated. It didn't take them long to violate that treaty uh, because they created the Bozeman Trail, which went right through that territory that they were given to have, to have access to. <clears throat> um, and um, these were all dedicated homelands. And most of these people were passing through. They weren't, they didn't want to stay. <clears throat> people in the wagons, people, the, the miners were looking, they get called in California, more gold there than there was here. Um, and the military, of course, went wherever they were told to go. Uh, Dr. Whitman eventually leads a number of people out to Oregon and, um, <clears throat> and to Washington. And Whitman starts um, as a college named it there after him in Oregon. Um, that was a sad story. His wife was um, uh, was very, he married her because she wanted to be a missionary to the Indians. But in those days, you couldn't be a missionary if you were a woman. So she married um, uh, Marcus Whitman. Narcissa Whitman was her name. Great name, right? <laughs> <laughs> And they went out and they settled. Um, you can go there today out in, in uh, I think it's Washington State where um, the Whitman Mission is. And they, they, she hated the people. She really disliked them and wanted to. They were, she got out there and found out they were, quote, savages to her. And she was really nasty to them. And they couldn't take it much. And eventually that story ends up with them massacring. <laughs> Her and and Marcus Whitman and any of the people she had around there. Um, 
And so that, that was one story that did go down in history is not so well. Um, but Wyoming people started to stay, started to remain here. And when they did that, they, um, they were doing different kinds of things. Um, Wyoming is now a territory. Many of them were ranchers, a lot of them from England and Scotland. These were the Anglicans for the most part. There were other people who came from England and Scotland who turned out to be Mormons who were starving. And, uh, and Brigham Young offered them all these advantages to come out to Utah. And that's how the Mormon Trail got started. Um, but the, the, the ranchers were fairly wealthy. Some of them didn't even live here. They'd come in and live in Cheyenne for a while. Uh, and Cheyenne was their sort of headquarters, but they would start these big ranches throughout the West. Um, and so the ranchers, they were basically political structure. And um, a lot of people were coming in, homesteaders, people who were getting plots of land through the federal law, the new 1868, I think it was, uh, law that was passed to allow people to make a homestead act. So they came in and used the Homestead Act and started these little, little ranchers. And eventually they wanted to get into the cattle business. So some of them started stealing the cattle from the rich ranchers. And that leads to the basis of the Johnson County War, which comes along later. Um, <clears throat> the military controlled the first reservations. And uh, the reservations were pretty strict. Had to do what the military said. The idea was to make Indian people into white people. So the first thing you do, you cut their hair. Okay? Long hair is a is an honor status for, for Native people. Yeah. So all the, the Natives had to cut their hair. Change the names. Your Indian names are no longer good enough. You needed white names. As they tell the story of Wind River Reservation, um, when, when they first organized the reservation, they were call, called in headquarters, tribal offices, and somebody had an English dictionary. And they said, oh, you're so-and-so, you're now going to be Shakespeare. <laughs> or, or, or Jones or something like that. So all of your names got changed. Um, although a lot of them tried to keep their actual names. Because you know, it, it was a battle. Um, so the first reservations were controlled pretty much by the military. And the military turned out to be fairly corrupt. <clears throat> and by corruption, I mean they would they would take some of the uh, proceeds that were guaranteed by the government, including food, and steal it and use it for themselves. And uh, it really didn't work very well. And so, in 1869, when President Grant was was the president, um, <clears throat> the Quakers were out there nationally, not in Wyoming, but they were national. Quakers went after Grant and said, you need to change this. You know, this is not good for, for Native people. They're being cheated. They're being robbed. There are terrible things doing to them. Eventually, they'd be taken off to schools like Carlisle and the East and other places. And, and most of them as children. After their hair was cut, their names were changed. They were given new English clothes to wear. And uh, a lot of them died right, right there. They died of homesickness, died of everything diseases. They didn't take care of them. But at this point, um, the Quakers went after President Grant, and he called what was called the Quaker peace issue, the Grant peace policy, or the Quaker policy. And the idea was the churches would take over the reservations. And as the story goes, they had a meeting in um, the Interior Department in Washington, and, uh, and all the denominations were invited to come. And even, even the Catholics, and I say that because there was a lot of Catholic opposition in those days. Um, and Father DeSmet was there. And he was old at that time, and he represented the Catholic Church. And all the other Protestants showed up, and uh, I don't think the Mormons were invited, but because uh, there was a lot of opposition against them too. And um, they put these maps on the floor in the Interior Department with all the reservations listed. And then they've divided them up and said, uh, Methodists, you can have these reservations here. Uh, I think a lot of them in Montana. Um, and Lutherans got others. 
Um, you know, they all got divided. Episcopalians got the biggest chunk. They got all of South Dakota, all those reservations, which are many. And oh, by the way, there's one in Wyoming, the Shoshone Reservation. And uh, you Episcopalians can have that one too. <laughs> Didn't even know where Wyoming was. <laughs> okay. And most of these, this, was, this policy lasted for 10 years and it didn't work. Uh, the churches didn't have the money to really do that. Um, they didn't act very well. The Catholics got nothing practically. They got a couple in Montana uh, because, because there was anti-Catholic sentiment, even though um, <clears throat> uh, our friend who was the big missionary um, was right there, knew it all, knew how to do it, but he was not, and he was very pro-Indian. And they just didn't give them any more than maybe one or two. So this project didn't last very long, lasted for 10 years. And uh, but they they had they brought in Christian Christianity, of course. And uh Christian Christians were doing their thing, but a lot of them really didn't have the staffing for that. In Wyoming, where the Episcopal Church had had jurisdiction, they turned the leadership over to a Quaker who was living in Cheyenne. And, uh, and he then became an Episcopalian, <laughs> but um, so he ran it and, uh, and he did a pretty good job. He tried to, to make it better than some of the other places. And then in 1883, he was joined by an Episcopal priest named John Roberts. And, and Roberts um, began a long-term ministry of 66 years on the reservation and the entire uh, Fremont County area. Every church that's out there in this Episcopalian <clears throat> was started by John Roberts over that 66 year. Um, and others were coming in. And of course, the other, the third thing that happened in 1868, which was so important, was the railroad came through. Mm -hmm. And the railroad basically followed the Oregon Trail with a few exceptions. And, um, and all those people, the railroaders, came in. And of course, as you know, the, you know that history. One side came from California, and with the big banker out there, Stanford, and uh, they used Chinese labor because uh, a lot of Chinese at that point in California, and they they built the railroad coming east. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Union Pacific started in St. Louis, and it was coming or Missouri. And it was going to come west, and they were going to meet in Utah, <laughs> which at that point was Mormon. <laughs> and uh, so they were given federal money to be paid by the, the mile, every mile that they would make to come east and west and meet. But nobody saw them where to meet. <laughs> and so they actually came up next to each other, and they figured, well, we're getting a lot of money for this. We'll just keep on going. And they, and if you go to that spot today in Utah, uh, they have it all, and it's two railroad beds went right by each other. <laughs> and they'll find somebody that says, we're paying you money for nothing. <laughs> and the and the Union Pacific had Irish uh, workers mostly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as I put in my book, if you read it there, the Chinese worked hard because they were sending all their money back to China, and they were working real hard. And they stayed out of trouble, and they just did, did their work. <laughs> The Irish were a little different. They liked to drink, <laughs> and many of them had alcohol problems. So they sent a Catholic priest along with them. <laughs> uh, it's really a funny, pretty funny story, the whole story. But when the railroad got to Cheyenne in 1868, it finally reached that point. That's where the first missionaries for Wyoming and people who wanted to stay in Wyoming came on that trip. Um, and so we have some of the first people that you should be familiar with if you're from different denominations. First missionaries arrived. Um, the first clergyman was W. W. Baldwin. And he was the first Methodist. He arrived in Cheyenne. And um, and he didn't have a church, they didn't build a church at first, they just kept a congregation, but he was the first. Um, and then came the Reverend Joseph Cook right after him. And Cook was the Episcopalian, and he was sent out to civilize Wyoming. <laughs> and um, he got off the train, and uh, he, oh yeah, he waited for the train. <laughs> Baldwin came by horseback. <laughs> he was a Methodist. 
Yeah. Yeah. And and anyway, Cook waited for the train and he got there. Now, let me think where I put this. Um, um, yeah. Well, here we, I have an index. I go to the index. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Joseph Cook, 7273. Um, <clears throat> Reverend Joseph Cook arrived in the city by train on January 14, 1868. It stopped building for the year. They, they shut down for the winter. <clears throat> to begin an Episcopal congregation, he was tired after crossing what he called the dreary, desolate plains. <laughs> he immediately uh, expressed his dismay as what he was up against. He proclaimed that the excessive gambling amounted to quote, poor, simple souls selling themselves to the devil. <laughs> on January 28th, he reported to Bishop George Randall of Denver on the illness sweeping the city and remarked that, that the hospital, quote, I was very much distressed to find that in numbers of cases, two sick men occupied one bed. <laughs> Cook can be credited for initiating the construction of Wyoming's first church building, which turns out not to be the first church building, <laughs> uh, St. Mark's Episcopal Church, which is located downtown Cheyenne today. At that time, it was um, it was just a wooden building, and later they built the prison that was there today. Did you all meet there all from mm -hmm. St. Mark's? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 2022. Yeah. And it's haunted. Yes. And, and what? The bell towers. Oh, the bell tower goes, yes. Um, that's a good, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but the, that's had a lot of famous things happen there over the years. Um, and later, Cook then moved on to South Dakota. So he didn't stay in Wyoming. He went back to South Dakota, where he took up the church, Episcopal Church at Wounded Knee. And when that wounded knee thing happened in 1890, I think it was, yeah. they used the church for a hospital with the Christmas tree decorated, you know, wow. the hospital for all the natives who were slaughtered in that battle. Um, so just little things do fit together. And I'll point out, churches had a rough time in early day Wyoming. Attendance at services was spotty. And early clergy were not particularly suited for their frontier assignments. The Wyoming Tribune, a new newspaper at the time, blamed the clergy for many of the church's shortcomings. One editorial proclaimed, quote, let there be good singing. Let the ministers tell their hearers something new each Sunday. The world today cares little about the color of Nebuchadnezzar's breeches. People long for something of the living presence. Let ministers raise voice against today's evils instead of constantly decrying other denominations and sects. I just thought that was a very prophetic thing. <laughs> so put it in. Um, there were other clergy who showed up. Josiah Strong, who was a uh, he was a congregationalist, but he was a, a reformer, and he really wanted to see. Because he thought the people were being exploited, especially on the ranches, especially on the railroad, mm -hmm. and uh, and he really fought for the, the, the dignity of the workers. Um, and we had some others. Um, early railroads and settler towns had a rough going, much drinking, carousing, and a few women. <laughs> and there's a story of a little girl from Connecticut who was put in a magazine where she said. Goodbye, God, we're going to Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> the first settlements after Cheyenne were Laramie, Rawlins, South Pass City, and Green River. What's that bring to mind? The railroad. The railroad. Interstate. It yeah. follows the railroad, which was eventually the interstate. Mm -hmm. And um, and a number of little towns that all disappeared. You can still find ruins if you drive along that area. They're off the road, but you can still mm -hmm. find some ru ruins of some of those towns. Um, and others settled the open range. Most were Italians, Irish, Germans, and the big cattle interests from England and Scotland. Some brought their faith traditions, and others were escaping religious discrimination. Early churches struggled with poor attendance and little money. 
and I, this is, I think, a prophetic comment of mine. I noticed women kept them going. <laughs> they wanted civilization, in quotations, and decent education for their children. Organized religion was not far behind. Early clergy struggled and tended to be moralistic. Many looked on them as this is a, a nasty word they call many people call clergy sky pilots. <laughs> uh, it was they, not a compliment. <laughs> it was not a compliment. Uh, some of them would shoot at the feet of the clergy and make a move. That was one recording of that. Um, I'm like, I don't know. That one's great. I'll get the back <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> get moving. Get those feet going. There's something. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so Cheyenne and uh, especially Rollins, Laramie, of course, uh, all have churches that date back to the Railroad era. Mm -hmm. And the clergy who came in, Cook actually went down and started the cathedral in Laramie before it became a cathedral. It wasn't at the time just a church. And then he went to, to, to uh, South Dakota. Back on the Shoshone Reservation, both Episcopal and later Catholic faith was imposed on them. The Arapahoes arrived here in uh, Wyoming in 1878. And their story was different too. They were given a reservation in Montana and they were forced to move there in the winter out of the Denver area, because uh, that's where their home was. That's why everything in Denver is called Arapaho this and that. Yeah. Um, and the, they were forced to move, and they came up along the mountains and starving and hungry. And they discovered that the Shoshone, their ancient enemy, was over in the, the Shoshone Reservation was there. So they asked the government, is it okay if we just camp there for the winter? And they went over to what is now St. Stephen's, which is just outside of Riverton. And they camped, and they camped, and they camped. <laughs> and there's a story, I can't prove this story, but it's a great story. Chief Washakie, who of course was the great leader of the Shoshone tribe, mm -hmm. would send somebody over after a while to the Arapaho side and say, well, we know you're doing well. Uh, when are you leaving? <laughs> <laughs> when are you going along to your other place? And they never left. Mm -hmm. And today there's a canal, a canal basically that divides what historically was the Arapaho and Shoshone side. Um, but um, it's been violated. In recent years, they've overcome some of that, uh, mostly through intermarriage. Oh, yeah. um, and you'll see that, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in August. August, mm -hmm. yes. We'll, we'll see that whole thing. We'll tour it. We'll see the, the reservation. We'll see the new mm -hmm. buffalo who've come in, that are brought in. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll get a tour from some of the best people you're going to get on the res. And you'll see the original church building. Now, I said, St. Mark's was the original congregation, mm -hmm. but the original <clears throat> building is the mission church that was put on the reservation during 18, early 1860s. It would have been because the treaty was 68 and they built this little church building. And um, um, <clears throat> so we'll actually see that. It's been, the Episcopal Diocese Foundation has rebuilt it and remodeled it. And, and it looked like it was falling apart. It was all collapsing or whatever. And there's some great stories associated with that building. <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, the, the, the people still had to deal with all of that stuff. George Roberts came in, John Roberts came in 1883. He was from Wales. And he wanted to be a missionary, and he didn't know who with. But... Uh, I think because of his health was the reason that his, his Episcopal helpers got him to come to the West. And uh, the bishop, I guess it was Bishop Randall, it might have been Randall, I can't remember right off who that was, um, sent him down to the reservation. He said, we got a place for you. We're going to put you on the reservation. We've had a church building there. We've had everybody there who's never had a priest. So in 1883, Roberts came. Shortly thereafter, he married his bride who came over also and, and um, they got married in Rollins and then they came up there and he started that ministry of 66 years um, and that's uh, it's got to be the record <laughs> yes. he was loved by everybody including native people really didn't like him um, people there today still honor him in many ways um, both tribes both the Rappahoe and Shoshone 
And he had it, I'll give you a picture here. It's a nice picture. What, what time is it, by the way? It's 646. Okay. A lot of time, my kid. Yeah, tons of time. This is a picture of Roberts after he got there. And um, taking off his. Well, I made me explain it first. It's a picture. We have on some metal lines still. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a picture of John Roberts uh, years later standing at church buildings behind me. That original church building. Now, that was not originally there. It was yeah, down page. farther. Mm -hmm. on, yeah. It's farther down on the reservation. They moved it up there mm -hmm. uh, after they built the cemetery. Cemetery is Sacagawea Cemetery, and that's the story of Sacagawea. And there's a Lewis and Clark, and there's a lot of contention over where she's actually buried. So mm -hmm. Dakota claims her, but the River claims her. And it says her grave well, is right, and her second son Basil's grave on the left. And the other one, who's called Conch, I think, the uh, one that Sacagawea carried on her back. I don't know if that's an incident. It's the old, other brother that uh, got buried up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was one here. However, there were three three grave sites. So that we didn't know, I asked a lot of people, who's in the third grave? <laughs> Nobody seems to know. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Second year cemetery we get a tour of. It's, it's a fascinating place. Uh, it's totally different than a white cemetery. Um, and one of my favorite graves, they started originally they didn't put gravestones in, then they put gravestones in. And my favorite one was this guy who's buried right in the middle. And it says under his name, buried like a white man. <laughs> 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 um, and this was when the building was before it got rehabbed, obviously. So if you can look. Is there somebody you can see this on there? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Definitely. So that's that's the story of the uh, of John Roberts, it's a very dignified looking guy. I mean, he was that's good. He ended up burying second career. And uh, I served that church, the Shoshone Church, for five years while I was in Weinberg. And uh, so I got access to not only the cemetery, did a lot of burials in the cemetery, but also um, uh, the parish register. And the parish register is fascinating because it has. Sacagawea's burial there, listed in the register. And then in, in an ink, somebody, I think it was Roberts, mm -hmm. put an arrow up in the corner to say, I attest to the fact that this is Sacagawea mm -hmm. <laughs> of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a question about that because obviously he put that there when the controversy started. So, and then of course he buried the famous Chief Washington himself in 1900. So he came in 1883, in 1900, he buried Chief Washakie. We'll see Washakie Cemetery as we the grapes as well. It's a different cemetery to the Washakie Cemetery. Um, so those are just uh, some of the things that were going on out there. And, um, and all that was happening, well, other things were happening as well. Um, a little side note, Germans settled in this area, uh, mostly at east of town out in the town of what is now called, I'm having my mental block here. It's a town called, yeah. I know what it is. Emblem Bank. Emblem, yes. They call it Emblem. There's a beautiful old uh, Lutheran church out there. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 uh, it. it's near Missouri City, so it's a little closed up, but beautiful church. But during World War I, when there was so much German sentiment, it was originally called Germania. That was its original name, Germania. And so they changed it to Emblem to, to, to get out of the country. So that's part of the German income. Um, Italians came in everywhere. Irish, they were quick to come. And uh, then they, and of course, the Mormons came back from, from Salt Lake and settled primarily in the southwestern part of the state, where Lyman, Fort Bridger, all that area. That's, that's heavily Mormon, even today. Mm -hmm. um, they settled here in Cody, Cody area, from all along here to Cali and uh, all the little towns east of here. Um, and they just got into agriculture. And they also settled, um, it's one other place too, they had a big settlement. But they were pretty predominant when they came back. 
uh, Byron, that's the other 10. Byron. Byron has a picture of Byron. Byron, yeah, Burlington, Byron. Byron, Burlington, Otto. Yeah, Otto. Uh, okay. Although the Protestants don't get to that, got there and been there ahead of them. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, that's some of how those, some of the churches came in. And uh, oh, one other guy, I don't want to miss, miss, miss his. Uh, Put him in the book there. The three different lectures on merging. <laughs> um, Sheldon Jackson. And he's in the book there too, and I got him in the book. Um, he was a Pres Presbyterian guy, and he came in with uh, all kinds of ideas, and he was a really aggressive guy, and he went through that same route that. With the churches and money, by the way, the money for those churches along the railroad were given by the Union Pacific. He gave each church a plot and money to build a church on because they wanted to be religious. So uh, Jackson came in and he put a church in every one of those towns, just like that. Uh, and he's well known within the Presbyterian circles. If any criticism of him, he was too aggressive. He'd start a church and he'd leave and go somewhere else. And then he ended up in Alaska. And uh, started churches there, and in Sitka, which is an island in Alaska, they have. They, but apparently, they had a museum. I found out from somebody just recently that the museum closed. But it was all about Presbyterians and Sheldon Jackson. So, so that's a, another story there. But that was all of those churches that did come in, and they created congregations. Um, and in my book, I call that this the chapter of missionaries and sky pilots. <laughs> um, there's also a picture of Josiah Strong here too, who's, who ended up actually beginning what was called um, uh, when, the, when the Christians I'm having trouble with remembering all this stuff. That uh, actually you say too? Social justice oh, oh, within the Christian church. Oh, the social reform movement. Yeah, Thank well, you, it, that wasn't the official name, but that's what it was. Yeah. And Josiah Strong was one of the leaders of that. Was it? it all came out of that phrase written, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you know. a bunch of women ministers yeah. from the Unitarian yeah. movement right. switched over to social gospel yeah. work. Yeah. Oh. So here's Sheldon Jackson. He's a very dignified looking guy. He's on page 70 here. Um, 75, 75. And again, he looks very studious, very, uh, very good. And on the next page, was the next controversial person was Bishop Ethelbert Talbot. And Talbot was a colorful bishop. He sort of did what he wanted to do. Oh, look, there goes my much. Bishop with the Catholic Church or the Episcopal? Episcopal. Episcopal. Is that yeah. the same? And, uh, he was our first Western aware? Our first. Yeah. Bishop. And that's his picture. And this is his book, My People for the Plains. And um, And also, and he was even had a supposed conversation with him and Butch Cassidy later on. Thank you. And Butch Cassidy, of course, was another person as well. Um, and this was this out of a book of a guy who claimed he was Butch Cassidy when he came back from supposed death, you know, uh, came back to the West to visit. And uh, as it turns out, it's been pretty much debunked. But it was a great conversation between. Bishop Talbot and Bush Cassidy. I'll try to read it before we leave. Um, so Talbot wrote in his book, he was sort of a narcissist too. Um, he came out here and he talks in this language of the, of the day and about, well, I'll try to read one to you here if I can find it. And that conversation with Bush Cassidy is not in his book, which is one of the things to keep in mind. Um, unfortunately, the page on And by the way, it covered not only Wyoming, it covered Idaho as well. Um, and I think maybe even part of uh, Montana. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I'll just give you one of oh, all his stories are, are funny and they're profound. They're, they really are. Um, 
They're also sexist. <laughs> Pastor needs to be a good man with lots of energy. <laughs> we can take yeah. the new West. Definitely have a hand. That's right. The narrative. <laughs> well, it's in the book. Take it to the book. The Unitarians were saying the same. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm doing it. Talbot, I mean, it's Talbot here. It's a good place for him. But he did, he was, he was, he really believed he was one of the people. And he acted like he was one of the people. He didn't act like a stuffed up bishop. Certainly not like a Catholic bishop. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he would do services at bars. He'd go and talk with the guy who owned the bar and said, Hey, yeah, I'm here to do a service, you know, on a Sunday. And they, they, they turned it over to him, let him preach in the bars. So, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, oh, he's in here quite a bit. 76 and 78. Well, that's his coming in this. Um, oh, yeah, there's another nice picture of 78. That is a, one that I, I, I got given to me by somebody, so it's not in anywhere. Uh, Reverend John Roberts at the grave of Sacagawea and her grandson, who's also named as Basil, mm -hmm. just like his father. And um, I couldn't identify him at first, so I asked some people on the res, who is that guy? And, oh, that's, that was Basil. And so they- He's the grandson. Yeah, the grandson. So there they are at that same cemetery, with a little church sitting back there behind. Um, uh, let's see. It's not the page. I do want to give you some of his, his conversation. 106, 107. So here's another little historical fact yes. that um, the first Daughters of the King chapter in Wyoming is named after Talbert. I should tell mm -hmm. Yeah, he was obviously the colorful bishop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he later went on to be the presiding bishop, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After he left Wyoming, he went to Missouri I think, first. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, here we go. Another traveling cleric was youthful and energetic Episcopal Bishop Ethelbert Talbot. In 1886, he was appointed by the Episcopal House of Bishops to leave Missouri and serve as Bishop of Wyoming and Idaho. Bishop traveled his missionary diocese by horse and stagecoach. He relished meeting all kinds of people in the community he visited. Unlike many of the so-called sky pilots, <laughs> Talbot was not put off by the bloody social scene he encountered. His goal was to recruit clergy who could come and adjust to the West's particular environment. He was aware that Wyoming workers, especially those in the mines, had little time for themselves and could easily be attracted on Sunday to things other than church. <laughs> Talbot saw an opportunity for the frontier minister to provide them with just not just a service, but also a place to go for constructive reading, card games, and medical, even medical attention. The bishop talked about the kind of clergy that were necessary, and he wrote, quote, if the minister of Christ is to be of any real help to men in such environments, he must first of all be a manly man <laughs> with a genius for service born of loving sympathy. The men of mining camps and ranch towns in Wyoming and Idaho used to implore me to send them a good mixer. He went on the same to do to do men good, they must be met on their ground. It is not a loss of dignity, but the truest dignity to identify oneself with the sorrows, anxieties, and even with the joys of those whom it is an honor to serve just because they are men. <laughs> to be as the great, as those whom it, it is an honor to serve just because they're men. To be as the great apostle said, try to be men, to be all things to all men. So he was using that old quotation with the men in it. That he might win some. 
So, uh, and then here's a, here's a book I put in one of my spirit of Wyoming on Christmas. The pastoral approach is quite different uh, than the practice followed by many of the clergy who imposed moral standards on churchgoers. The bishop had no problem holding services in saloons and recruiting some of the local bar patrons to attend. Once he was greeted by a cowboy in Sundance Saloon who blurted out, where in hell have I met you? <laughs> <laughs> and Bishop Talbot calmly replied, well, I don't know. What part of hell did you come from? <laughs> so anyway, so he was, uh, he was one of the real sort of true evangelists out there, you know, we're speaking on their terms. And he was the 14th presiding bishop, 1924 to 1926. Yeah. In those days, they just picked the oldest person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, by seniority of consecration. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, he was committed to the ecumenical movement. Hey. Okay? Yeah. So. That's right. He, he had a lot of things going for him, so he was, uh, and he was fairly well liked. And, <clears throat> and along with uh, John Roberts and Roberts. He was well liked too, and there's only if you, when we go to that Jesus Trinity mission, uh, we'll see his house, which is a large shack basically lived in, and that was when he was old and he couldn't see anybody, he lost his sight, mm -hmm. and uh, and I had a professor of mine in Lander when I was there, the guy who ran the, all the plumbing operations in Lander, <laughs> and he told me one day, so I went in to visit him one day at his house when he was old. And I walked in the door and I walked over to him and he knew exactly who I was because he told me I can tell who it is by the sound of their footprints on the wooden floor. Mm -hmm. so, that's how he knew who was, who was coming to visit him. <laughs> well, that's not in anybody's book. But... <laughs> so here's Roberts. And of course, Roberts had an assistant who came later who was an Arapaho priest. And his name. I'll tell you his story. I had this picture in my book somewhere. It's just there it is. <laughs> um, well, maybe it's not. Is it in the book itself? In the book itself, I think. Um, oh, yeah, it's in the book yeah. itself. And let me see what I. But the, my page picture is better. It's a big blown up. <laughs> um, anyway, his story was he was a rapper. He was, as a child, he was in a battle with, I think, some Lakota. And, um, and it was in Wyoming, and he was, as a child, was just wandering around, and Sherman Coolidge is his name. And there was a, an officer, a military officer, who came in on the scene and saw him, and then picked him up, took him back to the fort, Fort Washington, and then adopted him. And they say here, page 90, and this, this is him, um, Sherman Coolidge, and he basically got assigned to the Arapaho side of the reservation. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure we'll do this without a table. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, Sherman Coolidge um, stayed around for quite a while. Just, uh, he was there in 1897. Um, and he you know, got to be well known. Um, his famous line that I put in the book there, I can't remember what page it's on, is, is he eventually went on to the Cathedral of Denver, as, and his title was a canon in the cathedral. Uh, and somebody in the tribe asked him, Well, what's that mean? You're a canon. He says, It means I'm a big gun. <laughs> <laughs> For those of us who don't know what Episcopal language canon means, I don't know be a particular clergy yet. No, no, no. Is it not just a regular clergy person, but well, it's a regular clergy person, but it's just it's like an it's, a, it's a role, it's yeah, a certain it's a, role. So they made him a canon. Eventually, then he went on to California too. So he he moved around a bit. So 
trying to see. So anyway, that's a little bit about the reservation. I didn't want to put all that reservation stuff in there, but there's a lot of good stuff. And um, some great stories about Washington that, uh, that were legendary. And uh, I always like to share them because there's no record of them ever actually happened, but uh, people on the reservation tell the stories. And, and uh, one of them was this, there's a famous legend that goes around the reservation that you had a battle with the crow over the, over the mountain out there, there's a mountain out there, which Crow Heart Beauty is called now. And this is the one you see on the highway as you go to Du Bois from, from Lander or Erdogan. Mm -hmm. And um, actually it didn't happen at that mountain, it happened at another mountain farther back, I found out. But when the battle was over, that Washington took the Crow Chief, cut his heart out and ate it. Oh. That's why it's called Crow Heart Beauty. It, this is Sherman, right? No, sorry, no, no, don't get it. Okay. No, I'm going to show it to the folks on the. Yeah, yeah, that's only a big, big grown up picture of the ears. So I wanted to show it just short so they could see it. Like, it's a little blurry on there. Yeah, oh, there. There. Yeah. Just from Jumper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was in the church at Fort Washington. Yeah, at Fort Washington. Yeah, Fort Washington is the head picture. But anyway, Washington. Um, and that, that's the story that goes around is that some of the sign of the, uh, the monument and everything. And so one day, a number of, of people in Lander wanted to go out and speak with Washington and meet him. And, uh, and one of the businessmen went out to talk with him at his team. Mm -hmm. The government built him a house. They built him a house. But it was square. <laughs> and he didn't like it because it was, I can't sleep in a square built on that. I need a round it. But they went out to see me, and, and one of them supposedly asked him, is it true, Chief Washkey, that you had that battle with the Crow Chief and cut out his heart? But the way people say that's happened. And is it true that that's happened? And Washkey apparently thought about it for a while and said, well, he says, and this is the way Washington apparently talked. Well, he says, if the white man said that's the way it happened, I guess that's the way it happened. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. That's a big story. That's, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so moving right along here. I got lots of reservation stories. They're in my other book, if you haven't seen it. I got a memoir um, that covers all the reservation days, uh, lander days, Little Snake River days, which are wonderfully colorful. Um, so, um, and as I say, he buried, uh, Roberts buried both Sacagawea and Washakie, and I think in the book is also a picture of him over Washakie's coffin. Um, the church, the church is roughly, it does good talk in religion, struggled, but were immediate, ultimately successful. Oh, and one other person I'll mention is the guy who wrote this book. One little movement that took place during all this early time. Um, it was a missionary who came out whose name was Frank Moore. And but he wasn't a clergy. He was a started as a Presbyterian and came to do create Sunday schools. Sunday schools came before the churches. They came in these little communities and he'd come in and start a Sunday school, teach people how to run it. And, uh, and this is his story, his life story of doing all of that in all these towns around Wyoming. <clears throat> and uh, and he, he, a lot of them are letters to his girlfriend, who eventually married, marries. But, um, and it deals with a lot of the historical events that were happening at the time. Um, <clears throat> but um, more um, was simply like Bishop. Um, the bishop I was just talking about. And uh, he was here from 1888 to 1896 when he converted to Congregationalism because he said the Presbyterians were too uppity. They <laughs> the owned everything, which they probably did, and too, too had their nose stuck up in the air. And he was looking for a church that wanted to be more involved in life. So some of his stories are all in They have one. Um, he was also, he wasn't, he wasn't a moralist, but he was conservative style. That was his Sunday school style. Um, 
Yeah, yeah on December 7th of 1890, Frank's first name transferred his allegiance from Presbyterianism by joining the Congregational Church. His family, originally Congregationalists, had joined the Presbyterian Church when the Congregational Church of Iona, Michigan burned and was not replaced. Mm -hmm. The change was motivated in part by Frank's desire to return to his ancestral church, but even more by his belief that the Presbyterian Church was too authoritarian. Now we've heard Presbyterian lectures here in this group before. <laughs> And what they'll tell you is they have a lot of structure. <laughs> you can't get away from that. Uh, everything has to be approved by somebody else. In a letter to Frank at a later date, Merritt Moore, that's his brother, expressed his reaction to his move in his usual forceful manner. Um, and so that's how he changed. But um, that's a whole chapter all of its own. But he writes some things. Um, Uh, like he, he traveled everywhere. Um, <clears throat> I have just heard that the Indian agent, his brother, and a small party are to go to Yellowstone this summer. I could go with them and drive my pony on my cart, I think. <laughs> I would not need to lose more than three or four weeks by that means. Write me what you think of it. Um, you know, I mean, he was everywhere. He, he, he started missions in all those towns that were just mentioned a little bit ago uh, in the Bighorn Basin. Um, Otto being one, even though Otto's named after the former owner of the, the Pitchfork Ranch up in the TC. Uh, but Otto, and he started a mission there, Sunday schools. Um, there was even a place called Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N. I have not been able to locate where that was. Warren, Montana. No, Warren, Wyoming. It's over by Hyattville somewhere. But I can find no record of it. Um, and there were a couple other little churches. I think Basin may have been one. Um, and actually, the, the people loved the Sunday schools because the women wanted Sunday school for their kids. And in the midst of all the masculine stuff that was going on in Wyoming, they were in Sunday schools. And so he did that, and, and this is his book. And this is no longer available. I've luckily came across this one. But, uh, What's the name of the book? Souls and Saddlebags. <laughs> the Diaries and Correspondence of Frank L. Moore, Western Missionary, 1888-1896. And some of you remember that story of Cattle Kate, the woman who was hung mm -hmm. for the Johnson County War. When that happened, he reports on that and says, it was a terrible thing. It's a, a bad sign for the West. So you start hanging the women. <laughs> but maybe she deserved it. <laughs> because the cattle can't be afford to be losing all this cattle, you know. <laughs> and they accused her of being one of the robbers. So, you know, it's like um, it's part of the West. So that's just sort of a rough uh, oversight. No, and there's a couple of contemporary things because the book brings the whole history up the sleeves as far as the Matthew Shepard. And a few other things, um, including, I think I included the execution here. Execution so, of the, the, the last one we had. Of, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that was that was big for me because I was the chaplain for that mm -hmm. and had to be one of the witnesses. Is it in that one or is it in your memoir? I think it might be in the memoir. Yeah. I know it's in the yeah. memoir. In the yeah. yeah, I think it's in the memoir. I think I may have just mentioned we had the execution. When, what year was that? 1992. But he was on trial for like two decades before that in, in prison, waiting to, to get the final sentence. That's a whole story of its own. If you want to read about that, look, at, look it up in Wikipedia. Um, and it's, um, you know, I, I got to meet the guy, and, and, uh, and that's a story all of its own. And people hated him. Jerry Spence is the one who convicted him. Uh, even though he was a defense lawyer, uh -huh. and he never killed anybody directly, he got executed for arranging killings from a prison in California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
But that's a that's a separate story. But it is part of Wyoming's history, and the American Heritage Center would like to be one of the stack of letters from him mm -hmm. while he was awaiting the execution. Um, and it was the Association of Churches that he was appealing to, our original name. And I was president at that time, and so I got these letters in the mail, you know, from number so and so and so and so in Rawlins, Wyoming, landing right where it was. <laughs> it was. Uh, so it's it's just one of those things where, and I got to meet him a couple of times, even though the governor had to approve one of them the first one, because the governor would let anybody see him or interview him, no press, no nothing. And I went to the press because I was working for the Star Tribune on the site at that time, and had him write up an article on the fact that they would not allow a clergyman in to see uh, the guy who's going to be executed in four days. You know. And uh, it gave the governor bad news. <laughs> it was the governor Sullivan. <laughs> and uh, so he called me on the phone that morning <laughs> and said, you know, I'm not going to commute, I'm not going to commute his sentence. That's what we were asking him to do. Uh, all the denominations were all behind him. And just commute the sentence. There's so many questions about this. He said, I'm not going to commute it, but show up on this time on a certain, certain day and you're in the prison. <laughs> you got to visit a line. <laughs> So he overcame the, all the, the other authorities and let me get in to talk with him. Um, so it was a very dramatic time. But there were a lot of other kind of things that went on. Johnson County War. And that, even though you wouldn't think it's in a religion book about religious history. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I should read you that because it's, um, you can go see these sites today. And in Buffalo, they still remember it. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Let me see if I got the mm -hmm. index. I'm sure I do. And I didn't I just put the names in here. Um, I think it's under the title. Is it under the title of the ranch? Uh, the TA or? No, no, I'm sorry. A not so holy war. That's, I think that's under that. Yeah, that's chapter nine. Yeah, chapter nine. A couple of uh, a couple of things about that. There's it was a Mormon war. A lot of people don't realize there was a war against the Mormons, and that was after um, Utah became a territory. And, and uh, uh, what's his name? Smith. No, not Smith. Oh, no, Brigham Young. Brigham Young. <laughs> Brigham Young got down there and turned it into his own dictatorship. Sure. And um, and he was just doing things that he wanted. He was still promoting, um, okay. um, you know, multiple marriages yeah. and all of it. And so the government said, you got to stop all that. If you want to become a state, you can't, can't become a state. <laughs> and then he came over and burned Fort Bridger. He sent mm -hmm. soldiers to burn Fort Bridger and another fort. And so the army had to get involved and they sent General Johnston. That's how that was happened. General Johnston had been a Civil War general. Um, Albert Sidney Johnston, 65, 66. And they sent him with a military unit to, to invade Salt Lake City. And put, put uh, Brigham Young out of work. And, um, Maybe my window, which is not that good. Yeah, here it is. Um, section 65. Meanwhile, anti Mormon sentiment had reached a peak in Washington. In 1857, President Buchanan sent a military force of 2,500 men under the command of General Sidney Johnston to Utah. Their task was to depose Brigham Young and replace him with U.S. government-sanctioned officials. This began an unlikely event known as the Mormon War. Father DeSmet was called upon to serve as the military chaplain so he could serve the Catholic troops and use his influence to keep the Indians from aligning with the Mormons, which was a real concern in those days. DeSmet, when first meeting Brigham Young back in 1846, had been impressed with his determination for religious independence. But over the years, his views had changed 
and he now saw the Mormons as fanatics. The invasion of Mormon country turned out to be of short-lived duration, and de Smet never made it to the troops. This war was not only short-lived, but it did not amount to very much burdened down by supply wagons under contract to the shipping firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell, who were a bunch of evangelists, by the way. They made all their employees be evangelical. The U.S. forces had to stop short of Salt Lake and spent the winter of 57-58 near the old Fort Bridger site. <clears throat> Mormon forces called the Nauvoo Legion and burned both Bridger and Supply. They also set fire to the grasslands so to prevent the U.S. Army from feeding their horses. <laughs> they just burned all the grass. They made ready to defend Salt Lake and its approaches. But the Nauvoo Legion, under the command of Captain Lot Smith, and they were able to use guerrilla war tactics to harass the government wagon trains. The famous skirmish took place on a grassy ravine called Simpson's Hollow, near present day Parson. On October the 4th, 1857, and the oxen were driven off and the wagons were burned. There were no casualties. Smith's actions forced the army to become bogged down for the winter. And then it goes on to explain how some, some Gentile people from the East took a ship around to the Panama Canal, and came up that way to California, and then came over and made a, an agreement with the Army to settle it so that they settled the whole issue. So, you know, there's all this drama that goes on from these things that happened. Um, so that was the one war that didn't amount to much. The other one was the Johnson County War. And... Um, I don't know where, which, which square it is, because it's made a head of Mark, and maybe it's still not marked. Oh, no, this is a different one. Um, is that near chapter nine on Not So Holy War? Yeah, it probably is. It begins on 102. 102, yeah. Okay. Give you a break to fall asleep. That's all. <laughs> no, <Yeah>. falling asleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this gets into the whole idea of the ranchers got so much power and they were using it for their own benefits. And there's a picture of Frank Moore, too, by the way, on page 105. Um, so at this point, what's the predominant religious denomination in the state? At the turn of the century, 19th. Basically, one of the mainline religions is Catholic, okay. by far away. But, um, but you know, their membership is, mm -hmm. is iffy because it doesn't say it wants to be a Catholic, then you're always a Catholic, unless we depose you or mm -hmm. condemn you or whatever. But the LDS probably claim more, even though it's a little hard to figure out who they all are. You know, a lot of. Even in Wyoming. In Wyoming. Okay. Yeah, they're the two biggest. Mm -hmm. Evangelical, yes, but they're all broken up into mm -hmm. so many groups. A lot of them don't talk to each other. And that that's even in the 19, like, turn of the century, 1800s to 1900s? No, not, not that early. Okay. They're, they're new later comers. And they're all the pastors who didn't get in on the, mm -hmm. the early rush of the denomination, so they just came on their own. Um, they were the first Lutherans who were actually here too early, too, and they mm -hmm. got slaughtered by Indians. Okay. They didn't treat them very nice, I guess, in the Indians that um, Yeah, that, that chapter has the story of the L. Watson story of Cattle Kate mm -hmm. and how they hung her. And, and uh, because she was the big ranchers decided, including the sons who had the big ranch or had the biggest ranch out in that country. So are we saying cattle ranching is a religion, perhaps? Well, yes. <laughs> 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 <Not> you itself? <laughs> yes, I wouldn't disagree with that. Anyway, as the thing turned out, the cattlemen, the, the people who were, let's say Buffalo, were, were mavericking some of their, mm -hmm. you know what maverick is? Yeah, uh, stealing the babies. The, the the yes. Yeah, and then bring a little cow, you know, and they would steal it was easier. They were still even setting up their own ranches. That may have been happening. Um, 
but not to any great extent. So the big ranchers decided to pay them a little, to teach them a lesson. And they were all in Cheyenne and Casper, and they, and they hired a bunch of people from Texas, hired guns to come in who thought they were serving warrants, were misled. And then they all got on this train, and they took the train as far as Casper, armed and ready to fight a battle, a war, in Johnson County, which is Buffalo. And uh, they all came up, and they killed two bad guys that were known bad guys who were in a cabin. And, but they were liked in Buffalo. And uh, they were the only two that actually got killed in the war. <laughs> and they burned their cabin down. And uh, one guy was in there and made, wrote a diary in his final diary, said goodbye to everybody. <laughs> and, uh, um, we're getting burned out here. <laughs> it's going to be the end of this. Um, but they kept on going. And they met some other people who, who came across them from Buffalo. They saw what they were coming for and went back and told the people in Buffalo. We put together a whole big contingent of people. And the Methodist pastor at the time um, was the uh, son of, I think, the superintendent, and he had been in Buffalo. And the claim went that he gathered his entire congregation to go out with all the townspeople to meet him at what's called the T Ranch. And that ranch is up, it's about 20 miles, I think, outside of Buffalo. And it's a guest ranch. So we had a uh, Koji, Koji conference there. That wasn't that, but yes. You weren't there that yet. That was, that was about four or five years ago. And, uh, and that was fun. That was because the bullet holes were still on the wall of the ranch. And, and uh, yeah. the, the people in Buffalo came out there and they opened fire on the, the, the guys hid inside the ranch because mm -hmm. they heard they were coming. And they had a gun battle that lasted a couple of days. Nobody got hit, even though their bullet was everywhere. <laughs> Barn, you know, the house, you can see them. And uh, so I'll, I'll read this little part. The townspeople armed with guns and stocked with provisions marched to the TA and surrounded the ranch on the early morning of April 11th. This would have been um, 1892, I guess. One of the defenders, and, um, strong supporters, was the Reverend Marvin A. Rader. Rader was the local Methodist pastor whose uncle served as the district superintendent. In 1958, Marie Sandoz published the book, The Cattleman, in which she claimed Reverend Reader actually led a group of militant Methodists <laughs> to the fray and played a major part in the siege. She stated, quote, now the preacher gathered up 40 churchmen of the town and started out to slay a few cattle kings, not with the jawbone of an ass, but with the latest model Winchesters. They could scare up this late, all the ones they could scare up at this late hour. Rader afterward came away under heavy criticism from the cattle interests. The Chicago Herald reported a new leader named M.A. Rader has sprung up among the rustlers. He is a Methodist preacher and is said to possess qualities as a leader that make him very popular. The story went on to say that he once beat up another man in a fist fight. And so this made him very popular with the rustlers, and he comes now for the leadership. He's a fearless writer and a good shot. This was all recorded in a story by Cheyenne Leader correspondent writing from Buffalo, who then goes on to say, this is a lie, pure and simple. <laughs> Rader was ready to fight for his own, for his neighbor's homes. But he is or was not a leader and has no sympathies for thieves of any kind. Uh, Rader himself thought sought to dispel the story of his role in the conflict. In Cattlemen, I was unarmed and dared them to sh shoot me. Whether a leader or just a plain advocate, Reverend Rader played an active role in the affair. So I like this little thing because I discovered the letter was sitting there, the whole archives, you know, that he had written. And they still blame Raider, I think, for some of that. So some of that whole thing, because the whole thing came to a stance. <clears throat> um, the St. Luke's Episcopal Church tended to side with the cattlemen. <laughs> and the um, uh, and the other church, the Congregational Church, sided with the people. So that just went that out. And the church is even divided over that. And the Congregational Church is the one that has nothing in their records of them. They just blanked out that whole period of time. Um, 
Now, just to give you the summary, eventually the army came and shut it down because they were stationed in the port there. And the president, somebody got away and sent a telegram to the president to say, these famous cattle, rich cattlemen from England and stuff are all under siege. And so he sent the military group, which apparently was a black unit, we were stationed there to break it up. So, but I, I want to read you this last, this last story, this last part of the story. This is something that's pretty fascinating. In addition to being an active supporter of the defenders, the Reverend Raider also called upon to lead the burial service of Nate Chapman and Rick Ray. Those were the two guys that got burned out in a cabin. And they had a funeral for him on a, at a building in, in Buffalo. But the building stunk so bad from the burned bodies that the women all brought in flowers. <laughs> the smell. Uh, and the, both the museum in Buffalo, if you get a chance to go to that one, it's to operate, and they have all that stuff in the sun. Their burned and shot up corpses were carried in for all the town for all to see. The service was held in a vacant building on Main Street, was filled to capacity mostly by women. Flowers were brought in to soften the frightening inside of sight of the corpses. The Reverend W.J. McCollum, the Baptist clergyman, joined Raider in leading the service. Raider urged his listeners to abide by the law and leave any retribution to God. And he ended his remarks by repeating the scriptural verse, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. For the most part, Buffalo's churches tried to stay out of the conflict and to sue the differences. <clears throat> They recorded little of that in their records. All the dead were buried in respectful Christian manner. The cattle barons continued their economic and political dominance well into the 20th century. But the Johnson County War made them look bad. In 1894, A.S. Mercer, that's a name to remember, published a controversial book called The Banditti of the Plains. And, uh, that exposed many of the inner workings of the cattle industry. In the beginning, Mercer had been a supporter of the cattlemen, but he grew weary of their lawless arrogance. His book implicated many of them and in high positions, including Governor Barber, who was the governor at the time, and Senators Kerry and Warren. An effort was made to make all the copies of the book disappear. <laughs> Asa Mercer was the founder of the University of Washington. And if you ever go to in Seattle, if you ever go there, you cross Mercer Island mm -hmm. on the way in. Um, before coming to Wyoming to publish the Northwest Livestock Channel, in his sell-all book, he concludes by singling out one of the invaders named D.E. Book, B-O-O-K-E, or otherwise known as the Texas Kid. <laughs> this uh, man, on his return to Texas, killed his fiance and was sentenced to be executed at Fort Smith, Arkansas. His fiance was sentenced to be at uh, Fort Arkansas. Mercer quotes a story from the Buffalo Voice in which the kid, before he was hung, denounced all that the invaders planned to do and expressed regret for his actions. So the story ends with a line, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And then the chapter I end with, Mercer's story was a story of a war that really wasn't a war, told in a book that couldn't be found. <laughs> <laughs> it's since been reprinted. <laughs> you can buy that story. <laughs> um, so that brings us up at least more contemporary times. Um, the Matthew Shepard thing, I did do a whole thing on, and the story of that, and, and many, many, how many of you don't know the Matthew Shepard story? I just went to a concert. You want? I just went to the concert. She's a recent transplant from Kansas, so mm -hmm. she doesn't know anything. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, Andrew Shepard was a. Uh, uh, Matthew. Sorry, Matthew mm -hmm. Shepard was a, uh, was a college student at Wyoming. And, uh, but he was just traveling around. He did get in trouble from place to place. He was gay. And this is back in. When we should look it up. 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, oh, that was, yeah. yeah but because 2020 was the 20 year anniversary. Yeah, yeah. it was 1998. Uh, the 98, yeah, it was 98. And I was rector of Christ Church here then. And um, I remember when it hit the news that he was a gay guy who apparently tried to 
um, composition, a couple of guys in a bar, a couple of low life characters. Mm -hmm. And they played along with him. They took him out to the countryside and they hung him from a fence, you know. And after uh, they beat the crap. Yeah, after yeah. they beat him. He was still alive when a bicycle found him, but he didn't last long. And, uh, and that made national news. I mean, it was all over the place. There's even a national law now called the uh, Shepherd. Um, and the other guy from Texas, who got dragged around by a tractor pickup truck. What, what was it? Jim Bird. Bird, yeah. That was a regular Bird Shepherd Act, right? That all yeah. was passed federally. It, it led to a lot of hate crimes laws across yeah. the country in various yeah. states. And a lot of states copied it, except Wyoming, which is not copied it. Um, but anyway, um, um, he was hung, and then the funeral that took place at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Casper. And um, uh, it got protested by Kansas. Oh, it, got, yeah. it got protested by the famous. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, you know, what's yeah. the name? Uh, it's it's in the book. Here. Oh, oh so it's Fred Phillips. Fred Phillips. Yeah. And no, that's not my kind of Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Westboro folks. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, think it's it right. Right. And, and he appears in my book several times because he also. He, he was an anti gay guy, isn't he? And he had his whole family, his congregation, he called his congregation, they were mostly his relatives. They all yeah, looked just like him. Yeah. yeah, they all looked like him. And I, was, I confronted him once in Philadelphia when they had picketed the Episcopal Church Convention. I just went over to see who they were and look at him. And all the kids in the line were all protesting and they all started hissing like snakes. They're schooled from the age of two, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, he appeared twice, once in this in, in the funeral. And um one one sixty-six. Um the funeral was had a lot of protests because of Matthew Shepard being gay, and uh, but a lot of people supported him too. And right out in the little park in front of Saint Saint Mark's, um, yeah, I have that in here. However, the strong support from pro gay groups, Matthew Shepard Hate Crime Act finally passed Congress and became law October twenty eighth, two thousand nine, eleven years after his death. The Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah, the funeral also broadcast for the rapidly anti-gay, rapidly anti-gay Westboro Baptist Church and its leader Fred Phelps. The church made up mostly of his family members, <laughs> raised on, on opportunities to participate in extreme protests, carrying signs like "God hates fags" and "Matt Shepard rots in hell." The group showed up at the funeral on a snowy October day. However, they quickly were surrounded by many of Shepard's supporters who obscured their protest with giant angel wings. They all brought these big angel wings and surrounded the protest with big angel wings. Yeah. Um, the Westboro Baptist Church continued its tirade against gays. Phelps' group became well known for protesting at funeral services of American soldiers killed in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Their argument was that these soldiers deserved to die serving a country that allows equal rights for gays and lesbians. lesbians. The church also took out its wrath against one of Wyoming's iconoclastic leaders, retired U.S. Senator Alan Simpson, here in Cody. Mm -hmm. Simpson, Is that the same Al Simpson we saw in the mm -hmm. previous video? Yep. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Simpson, who served in the Senate from 79 to 97, received a national reputation for his humor, straight talk and disdain for Washington's politics as usual. He was one of the few Republican leaders to argue for tolerance toward gays and lesbians. After leaving the Senate, he stated, homosexuality should, not, should be a non-issue inside the GOP. In arguing against a proposed Texas law that would criminalize homosexual relationships, Simpson stated, most of America has made peace with the principle of live and let live, now is the time to bring this, this law up to date. 
Um, Simpson's attitude did not sit well with the Westboro protesters. They were angered by Simpson's pro-gay views and by his ongoing support for then Vice President Dick Cheney, whose daughter was gay. In October of 2004, Phelps and his church members threatened to picket the University of Wyoming football games. Natrona County High School, where Shepard and Cheney both attended, St. Mark's Episcopal Church, and quote, I love this, Bag Simpson, Alan Simpson's church in Cody. <laughs> it's my church. My <laughs> uh, he also threatened to picket Simpson's funeral when that day would come. The process never came off. We planned for it. We had a whole thing. We weren't going to let him stand on the search ground. They had to stand in the street, which just happened to be Simpson Street. <laughs> <laughs> and the chief at the time, you know, I was chaplain back then too. The chief at the time said, well, if they get out of hand, we'll just act like a bunch of country bumpkins and put them all in jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what Al Simpson and Cody was just Still alive. No, he died a few years ago. Yeah. I wonder where it's going. <laughs> um, yeah, like Westboro's definitely still around. They come and protest. Yeah, but he's getting it. You're doing something right. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> the protest and every take off. Yeah. Um, and Simpson brushed off Phelps' insult, saying, If nice guys finish first, God knows where this guy will end up. <laughs> He, the most serious religious-oriented threat came from a white supremacist church called the World Church of the Creator, and that did start here in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. and that, these were white racist nationalists. Um, and so you had a whole thing about them that you can read for yourself in the book. And, um, and it's somewhere in the book I put down that uh, he did die. Phelps did die. And that, well, that means he won't be attending Al Simpson's funeral because Al's a liar. Yeah, still going. <laughs> and he's in church every Sunday morning, you know, mm -hmm. usually proclaiming some little tidbit of, of advice to everybody, <laughs> 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 including this latest one, which was just a couple of weeks ago when he came early to church. He walks on a walker and a cane now, and he has a, a, a caretaker. His wife always comes with him. And they always get there late because it takes a while to get in and see this boxes pew. And one day he came in early. He was there a half hour early. They're all sitting there, the first ones in church. And during the announcements, he had to get up and say, well, you notice, well, probably some of you noticed we came early. He's 93. And he's not been well. But he did, we did came, come early. And we just wanted to let you know that we're, we're to be known as not the late Al Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he comes up with a different line every Sunday. <laughs> so, anyway, that's that's a, a brief history. There's a lot more. A lot more. What kind of thoughts do you have about anything historically? One of the things that just occurred to me as you were speaking about the, is it the world creation, the Church of World, Church of world Creation, was that out of Casper? Did that have any sort of I guess I would say well, let me, location. I because I read that chapter and yeah. and I I was not remembering. No, I think they came out of rivers. If I'm not mistaken, it says in here. It uh, does. Um, maybe I missed that. I read too fast. <laughs> so the, where was the Church of the World Creation? Kind of headquartered, headquartered from. Life. I'm just repeating it loud enough for the Sorry. online. Yeah, it didn't last very long. It, people turned against it, um, mm -hmm. and may have even been Duke Voice. Let me, let me find that again. Um, um they, didn't, they didn't last very long at all. Association of churches took a strong stand against them. Mm -hmm. um, Church of the World, Church of the Creator. What page? So 167. Okay, 167. Yes, yeah, toward the end, I know. Who wrote this in 2012? 12. It won the award for best non nonfiction history of the uh, 
Is there best? Well, I guess historical okay. fiction. To say, is there a best fiction history? <laughs> Historic. Well, there is. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, yeah, all things like Longmire and some of those I can remember that. Can't compete against them. <laughs> um, okay. Here, here it is again. <clears throat> Just a little good thing, actually. Um, Riverton. Yeah, it was Riverton. Okay. I'm um, sorry, I missed that. The thinking grew the following that it, that it grew following from small but hate filled groups, um, such as the Aryan nations in southern Idaho. One such group did single out Wyoming, where they counted on its overwhelming white majority to rise to their cause because they wanted a race war. The World Church of the Creator, uh, considered a neo Nazi movement, began in 1973 and in 2005 was led by Matt Hale. After much publicity and numerous lawsuits, the organization changed its name to the Creativity Movement. In 2002, it was announced that this group would make its world headquarters in Riverton, bordering the Wind River Reservation. They're obviously not there now, so. Okay. Uh, reaction in Riverton and the surrounding area was intense. Human rights protests were organized and led by area residents, members of the Wind River tribes. Hale himself was arrested for threatening to kill a federal judge, and in 2005 was given a federal prison term. This so-called church quickly exited from Wyoming. It was simply too extreme even for Wyoming's religious conservatives. Um, for the most part, extreme religious groups have not been able to infiltrate Wyoming's traditional live and let live mantra that Al Simpson was talking about. I think that maybe has changed now. I was just going to ask. I was going to ask you, do you feel like that's still the same? But you just answered that. You feel like that has changed. Yeah, that's changed. Okay. Um, not okay, but not okay. But <laughs> yeah. Understood. Thank you. And one other guy you want to know about, because uh, he was one of my heroes, and he lived in Lander uh, when I was there. And his, um, his pictures in here, too, in the back. His fellow name is Tom Bell. He's actually on 170. 170, yeah. And Tom was a, um, his story is great. He has a tremendous story that he liked to tell. Notice he has one eye patch on the picture. The picture has one eye patch. And that's the nature of his story. He was in World War II, he was a, um, a, a bomber crew in, over, I think it was Germany. Uh, or it's one of the countries in Germany and captured, it might have been France. And he tells that story, and he was hit, they were, the plane was hit by shrapnel, and he lost the eye. And he felt that was a miracle given to him by God, because the plane was shot down and he lived. And, um, and he committed his life as a born-again Christian to saving Wyoming's environment. And um, and he gave me that picture, by the way. I mean, I asked him for a picture and he gave me that. Um, and he he's just a neat guy to talk to, And but he was very bitter about the fact that people weren't saving Wyoming's environment. And um, he started the um, uh, Wyoming Outdoor Council, which presently lives in Lander. And uh, they're the major environmental group in the state. And we work with them as, an, as a program. Uh, he's the founder of that. Uh, he's also found of High Country News, if any of you are familiar with, with that. It's a major regional Western magazine. Um, and uh, and he's just devoted his whole life to change, to getting the environment changed. His, story, his stories in the profiles encourage as well. Yeah. 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 I was just sitting here thinking, I read about him before <laughs> this. Where do I know him yeah. from? That's the reason why. So our group, for those online, our group also read Profiles in Courage by Roger McDaniel. And I can put that in the in the chat. And it has several stories of, of different heroes and heroines in Wyoming, one of them being Tom Bell. Yeah. And you're just a neat guy to know. And um, he's also a historian. So he wrote, wrote history stories and uh, oversaw the museum in Lander for a long time. Uh, he got around. He was just dedicated, committed, 
And he lived a life of poverty. He lived in a just beaten up old house. And, you know, um, and even after he went broke funding the high country news, yeah. after he hit bad times for a while, then they had to move to Colorado. But, um, and they still count him as their founder. He's right in the headlines. So he's a good guy to know about too, um, uh, along with some of the other people who have moved the state in many ways. Any other questions you got? How close are we to eight? Nine minutes. Oh, okay. Got nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Any online questions? And Barb, I had you muted um, for the recording. So if you want to ask a question, I need you to unmute on your phone. Yeah, but I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say thanks both ways. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. So no let me ask a broader question. Sure. Um, I was having a conversation with a, an acquaintance who is LDS. Mm -hmm. And because the church in Powell that I belong to, the Methodist Church, is in the process of federating with the Presbyterian Church, uh, we were talking about membership generically in churches, not any specific denomination or specific congregation. And so uh, there's a, a question in my mind that comes from a couple of places. But what, what I'm getting at is, is this time period in our religious life, anything like the Reformation, when we spent a long time achieving what we've been living, as it were, for the last three, five hundred years, and that some of us won't live long enough to see what the other side looks like. And I, I feel that way personally, sure. and I don't know if I am being pie in the sky or if I have I don't know that I have any insight, but yeah. that's what it feels like to me. And by the way, we have um, you you all Methodists of now now you get your fight over with for the most part. Uh, we've approved the Episcopal, we will approve in our convention. Yes, mm -hmm. you know. Well, the first step. First yeah. step. Yeah. Well, I can actually the first step was the they, they said it's 2030 before it'll actually all be done with oh, the canons yeah. and the constitution. Yeah. 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 yeah, you have yeah. to kind of recognize each other type thing. Yes. Right. Full, full connection. Full, full yeah. Communion. Full communion. Sorry. Full yeah. Right. Right. Full yeah. communion it will happen, but it will take some This summer, and then it has to be approved once more in 2027. Mm -hmm. And by the time they get all their constitutions and paperwork right. figured out, It'll be 2003. Mm -hmm. But, um, and to my knowledge, it, we have a tribal liturgy we can do during communion. Mm -hmm. It's been there for years. Mm -hmm. And the only time in Wyoming we've used it is I did it when I was head of the Association of Churches in Basin with the Methodist Church in Basin. We had a great time. <laughs> we had ju juice here, wine here. <laughs> All, all the Methodist kids wanted the wine. Yeah, it was pretty cute. <laughs> yeah, we had a big dinner afterwards. It was great. People all knew each other. I said, why don't we do this more often? I, I encourage Episcopalians to try doing it. Nobody wants to do it. I think if you used to meet with other UUs more than once a year. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. And, and uh, you know, that's just part of who we are. I mean, if, if I can, then I just can really can answer the yeah, that, well, nobody knows. I mean, yeah, I feel like it's always in the future, and the future changes. Uh, so, so we that's, thought we'd be where we are today. I mean, look, look at uh, Al Simpson thought we were kind of pretty much live and let live, and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, that was that fair. and that was my only attitude. Absolutely, you can be, you can be anything. Just don't mess with what I believe, you know. Well, or or don't push too much. I remember there being a candidate for an office, a federal office. All he had was a post office box in Casper. Yeah. And his political committee consisted of skinheads. Oh. Yeah. And finally, Casper, he was having some yeah. kind of a rally at Casper. 
didn't quite come in their bib overalls and pitchforks, but pretty much they said, we don't believe that you really want to represent us. And he kind of folded his post office box and went back to California. <laughs> yeah, <we laughs> For lack of a better way to describe it. But yeah, you can only push us so far, yeah. <laughs> generally speaking. Let me read the last page of this, because um, I thought, I tried very hard to, to be honest with this book and to all denominations. Mm -hmm. Even the LDS, which everybody likes to criticize, but I, I, I tried to be good with that. And I even got letters when, I, when the book was published of, of LD, from LDS people saying, Thank you for not um, bashing. doing what bashing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Everybody writes about us, they bash us. And you just left it out there the way a lot of people think it might be, but you know. Um, so so that's, and so I thought that was good. But anyway, here's, here's how it goes in summary. The faith community, as diverse as it is, has survived and generally prospered. Generally. <laughs> they have managed to leave their mark on the state. Every Wyoming town can display various church buildings and houses of worship. Some are elegant Gothic structures with bells, pipe organs, and stained glass windows depicting the stories of faith, including Christ Church here with that, <laughs> in my own mind. <laughs> Um, others are small but quaint churches that serve as reminders of the post World War II church growth period, because that is when most of the denominations all grew after the Second World War. Some of the newest buildings attempt to emulate the megachurch structures found in larger cities and suburbs outside Wyoming. Large paved parking lots are the symbol of their anticipated church growth. And they're all that way. They have big parking lots. LDS steakhouses with their um, spires reaching upward, and I wrote this in 2012, <laughs> are often best made the best maintained buildings in a community. Well maintained lawns and parking lots say that they are here to stay and they are open for business. Some churches operate out of storefronts and are not pretentious. Charismatic pastors often run them on minimal budgets. Other storefronts and old historic church buildings are utilized as churches for the growing Latino population. Some groups, such as Quakers, don't need buildings at all. Most all of these groups would ultimately acknowledge that the church is a community of faith and the buildings are only instruments of that faith. But, these, but what these buildings say is that the faith community has been in Wyoming from the beginning, and it has no intention of going away. Despite divisions, the faith community has added a sense of validity of stability to every Wyoming town and city. They are mostly taken for granted until a crisis occurs. And it is then that the community, the faith community, will step up and make it possible for the community to cope. They have provided a sense of community in a state that prides itself on independence. They have provided a sense of something holy in a world that directs itself elsewhere. They have sought out sacred ground and some feel they have found it. They all have a story to tell. This book has been about those stories. They cannot go untold. So. That's my editorial time and opinion. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. It's a, it's a good summary. I was, and, and I was noticing the church buildings as we were driving up here to Cody. Yeah. And it's different for the variety of, of them um, from the old and run down, the ones who've been here over 100 years, to the, yeah. to the new LDS church with the best yard between here and Saratoga. <laughs> our old Episcopal church, which we kept around because it was historic, yeah. from 1902, yeah. from a poker game with Buffalo Bills. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's the, that's the beginning of the church here in Cody, right? The beginning yeah. of the church in Cody. The hand got so high that it got embarrassing for his friends and every other. And they all decided amongst themselves there'd be some bad feelings. So they agreed that whoever won the hand would, would start the first church in town of Cody with money. So they got the nickname the Poker Church. 
So there you have it. <laughs> Warren, we want to say thank you yes. for everything you've done for us, but for the state of Wyoming too. <laughs> All your your experience here. Yeah. Yes. And we want to say thank you. And that is our thank you for how you've done. And it, yep. it doesn't represent how you've done, but it is a thank you. Recognition. Yep. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Since 1977. Thanks, Liz. We'll hopefully see you tomorrow or Saturday. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Barbara, for joining us. Okay.